to start tonight's meeting by acknowledging the lands we're meeting on. Uh, I'm in Dubbo today and uh, as such it's Wiradjuri land. I'd also like to acknowledge that we work on the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and nations and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and culture and ongoing contribution to shape the life of the communities in which we live in. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just from the point of view of tonight's meeting, uh, we'd encourage you to use the chat to put your questions through. Um, if you're having problems using the chat, um, then I'd suggest that you come off mute. Uh, there's a there's a hands up, I believe, function within the in the software. Uh, and if we acknowledge you, we'll um, ask you to then come off mute and and ask your question. But first point would be to uh, to use the chat. Now, if you um, please remember to type your full name in the chat. That's gone. <laughs> That's for attendance. Mute if you're not speaking. So, um, and yeah, again, yes, mute if you're not speaking. All right. Thank you very much. Next slide, thanks. <clears throat> okay. Good evening, everybody. It's Sonia Berryman speaking. We thought we'd hold this session tonight to try and answer any of your questions in regards to the rollout of the COVID-19 EOI. Um, we will do our best to answer any of your questions and give you some information, but please note we might have to take some um, back to the department to get some correct answers. So we don't want to give you the wrong answers. So we'll just take them on notice and then come back to you tomorrow once we've um, guaranteed that we're giving you the right information from them and confirm the data, the info that we're giving you. So to start with, um, we'll just give an overview on where things are at in regards to COVID-19 vaccination program. So stage 1A, as everyone is probably aware, is has the Pfizer vaccine has now been TGA approved. That vaccine will be delivered through hospital hubs. And across our region, we have one hospital hub, and that is located in Dubbo. Um, at the moment, we're not sure how the vaccine rollout will happen through the hospital hub but we're meeting regularly with the local health district to help plan the way that that will happen and how we can get the Pfizer vaccine from Dubbo to all the areas that are included in phase 1A of the um, strategy, rollout strategy, which will include aged care um, and disability care staff and residents and frontline health workers. So we're just working with the, depart um, the department and the hospital, um, local health district to work out the logistics of that. Stage 1B is where GPs come in. So the department released the EOI form, which um, hopefully everybody received from me late Friday night. That opened Saturday morning and closes on the 1st of February at 11.59 p.m. Um, so hopefully you've all looked at the EOI and any questions I'm hoping to answer tonight through some of this information. The AstraZeneca vaccine has not yet been approved by TGA, so some of the finer detail around um, the rollout of that is yet to come to us wait pending what happens with the TGA. We do know that it comes in multi-dose vials. They'll come in five mil vials, which will hold 10 doses each vial. So each person will get a 0.5 of a mil per dose. And the department are looking at a zero wastage policy on that. So that needs to be figured into how we roll it out to our practices at doing 10 patients at a time. Can you change the slide, please? 
it <clears throat> might be a bit small for people and I'm happy to share this if anybody wants it after tonight. So like I say, um, currently it stands at around 1,500 people have put in it, practices I should say, have put in an EOI and that's only the first few days. So there'll be a lot more that go into that portal. An EOI needs to be completed for each practice location. So if your practice does have more than one location, you will need to put in for each location. And once you've submitted your EOI, if you do need a PDF copy of that, we have the ability to go into that portal and print it and send it to you. Um, so just let me know if you need that. Practices are expected to vaccinate outside of their practice population. And that's one of the um, questions in the EOI document um, is that you can, you have the ability, I guess, to, to do the town if you're the only GP in the town, or if there's two practices in a town and you might get um, <laughs> told you can go first, that you actually have ability to do outside of your practice population for that cohort of patients for 1B. Um, the, it will be a phased approach. So not every practice will come on straight away. It's all dependent on the vaccines being available. So the Department of Health has purchased so many vaccines of the AstraZeneca vaccine from overseas, that will kickstart the phase of 1B. But then pretty quickly after that, CSL in Melbourne will start manufacturing the vaccine here in Australia. And that will then enable the department to bring more practices on over that period as we get more availability of the vaccine. So not everybody will be able to start up front but it should be a phased approach um, across the region and the department makes the decision at the end of the day who will get it and who won't based on the EOIs that are being submitted. So my advice is to put as much information into that EOI that you can that may get you over the line before another practice as such or, or our area over another PHN area because we still don't know how many we will be allowed to have. Um, that's still sitting with the department. Training will be mandated before anybody gets the go ahead to vaccinate. Um, and we're still not sure how that will happen. The department has put out a tender for training providers to come forward. Um, there is talk that that will be online, but that's not confirmed just yet. The AstraZeneca vaccine needs to be stored in dedicated vaccine fridges between that are between two and eight degrees. So like your normal vaccines are already kept at that. So that nothing should change for that vaccine. As you know, there's an MBS available. Um, and just to clarify what that is for our region, the first dose is $37.35. Um, if it's given after hours, it's $49.50 and the second dose is $27.55 and after hours, $39.70. So a PIP payment will be um, given $10 per, per completion of the second dose if that, that both of those doses have been done in your clinic. You can't bulk bill, um, add the bulk bill item number, the 10990 and the 10991 on top of that. It has already been included in the, in the MBS item number. And that was confirmed by the department today. So next slide, please. Everyone may have seen this already and I, like I say, I'm happy to share any of this with you after. Um, so phase 1B is what we're talking about now. Um, phase 1A is the hospital hubs, phase 1B is our GP clinics, and phase 2 upwards will include pharmacy. Next slide, please. 
So some of the things in the ERI to consider are the models of care. So how are you going to run the vaccine clinic in your practice? So what the department is looking for there is confirmation from you on how you're going to run that clinic. How many sessions you might be looking at? Are you doing it session-based? Are you running it all the time? Uh, do you have a separate um, area of your practice that you're running it through? Um, approvals based on throughput. The department's looking at high numbers. They want to know how many um, patients we can push through practices at any one time and readiness. Um, the pressure is on for throughput. So they want to try and get as many people vaccinated as possible, pending numbers of vaccine available. The FAQs, so we met with the department today. There is a frequently asked question document to be released. We're hoping in the next 24 hours on that, which will give some um, further information for you and us around um, some questions that you might have for tonight, but that will cover the co-claiming rules and what they might look like and lots more information around the national booking system because we don't know that information yet. The vaccine will be distributed from the Commonwealth, not the state-based vaccine centre. So making sure that you're all aware of that. So the, um, the Commonwealth will have oversight on how much vaccine is being distributed at any given time. Uh, anybody doing the vaccination should have done CPR training in the past 12 months or have um, a valid CPR certificate. Um, you need to look at your emergency protocol as well for your practice and just making sure you're aware that PPE requirements, including the consumables, will only be considered by the department on a case-by-case -case basis. So you need to look at your, how much you have in your practice and trying to get some from your um, providers already because the PHN won't have um, any to distribute to practices either. So please look at your numbers and order from your um, providers in case you can't get it from the department because they haven't yet said what their numbers will look like in regards to distributing consumables. Next slide, please. So further information will come on the national booking system. Further information will come about connecting to the AIR. We know that it's done through your PROTA and majority of our practices already have connection to AIR. Um, some of the updates will come with the next update of your clinical software. So I would encourage to, you to make sure that you have the latest update of clinical software when we start vaccinating because in that update we'll have all the links um, and connect connectivity to the national booking system as well. Adverse events need to be documented to TGA and the NCS, which is the surveillance um, in New South Wales. Uh, further information will come out with that um, once it's been TGA approved. Ensure your clinical software is up to date, like I've said, and think about your informed consent process. I've put a link there, um, which I'm happy to send out to make sure that everybody also has the general practice COVID-19 safety plan that you've done that as a business plan. Um, a lot of practices may have filled out one previously, which was a general business COVID safety plan, but there now is a general practice specific one on the department's website. And we would highly encourage you to make sure you've got that one filled out um, in case of auditing. Next slide, please. So things to think about now uh, to complete that EOI if you're interested in um, participating in the program. Data cleansing is the crucial element here. Look at your patient cohorts for each phase that you might be vaccinating. So look at the elderly adults over 70 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, anybody in your practice that may have an underlying medical condition, 
including those with a disability. Um, we need to be able to, to look at the numbers, look, use your pen if you have access to pen that we provide for you. Um, look at that, do some filtering, do some searches, pulling up the numbers of how many patients you will need to think about and how you logistically can, can run a clinic to cover the, that amount of patients. We can help you with that. The practice support team can help you with that. So please reach out if you need assistance. Think of your patient flow, pre and post vaccination. We're being told it could be up to 30 minutes post vaccination that patients may have to hang around. So think about how you're planning your practice, where they will sit for that half an hour. Um, ensure you've got an anaphylaxis kit available. You need a practice communication plan so that you're sharing clear, confident information with your patients. How are you going to promote that you um, do have the vaccine and can give it to your patients? Just thinking, these are just thinking points really. Consider your appointment structure. Um, until we know what the national booking system looks like and how it connects to your clinical software appointment, um, appointment bookings in your clinical software, that will give us further information once we're a bit more clearer on how that looks. Think about your patient recall systems and how you can recall these patients for their second dose. Flu season will come. At this point, we're looking at May, but there is 14 days between the COVID vaccine and flu vaccine. Um, the TGA approval will confirm that, but at the moment they're saying 14 days between them. So it'll be 14 days between the first dose, flu vaccine, and then another 14 days to you can have the second dose. At the moment we're hearing it's um, 28 days between first and second dose, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. It confirmed yet. Um, vaccine supply, things to think about is that when you give first dose to a patient that you quarantine the second dose in your fridge so that you have the availability of that vaccine to do that cohort of patients. Because we don't, there's the uncertainty of how many vaccines you'll get, we just need to make sure that each round of patients that you do, you've quarantined the second dose in your fridge so that you can finish that COVID vaccination for that group before you get your next lot of vaccines. I hope that makes sense to people. Um, consider fridge capacity. Have you got things in your fridge that you no longer need to have there? Thinking about capacity of the COVID vaccine and then flu vaccine when that time comes. Next slide, please. I put a whole heap of links there, um, which like I say, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint of important sites for you to look at if you're looking for further information. I'm happy for you to reach out to, to me at any time, um, pending that I know the answers. And like I say, it's, it's still a little bit early. We've got more questions than we're receiving answers at the moment from the department, but they are under the pump as well to try and get this information out. The FAQs we're expecting by the end of the week, so hopefully that will give us further information. I'm happy to try and answer any of your questions now, um, if you wouldn't mind popping them in the chat, and then, um, or you can, you know, email me, ring me, anything beyond today. Um, and as soon as we get further information, we're happy. To, I'll be happy to send that out to everybody as the information comes in. Sonia, we do have... Sorry. Sorry, we do have a couple of Go questions. Ahead. Did you want me to yeah. read those out for you? So the first question is from Tracy. If your practice is not chosen in the first round, can your phase 1B patients choose to wait for their vaccination until their usual practice is approved? Yes, Tracy, that's that's fine. Um, if you're not in the first round, it'll only be um, a very short time frame that you will actually get brought into the realm of being able to do it. The department is hoping to bring every practice on that wishes to vaccinate. 
um, over that period of time. But like I say, it's just dependent on the moment on the number of vaccines that we'll have uh, access to. But yes, you, you, your patients can wait. If, 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 but what I would suggest is that you communicate that to your patient, patients. If you're not in the first round, I would suggest you communicate to your patients that you haven't got them yet, but you will be getting them soon. Very similar to flu vaccine when the media comes out and says, go and get your, your flu vac, and it's still another six weeks before you actually get them. We've got another question I from Tracy. Yeah. Will all practices who want to vaccinate be eventually approved if they meet the selection criteria? Yes, they will. Like I just said, the department does want every practice who wishes to vaccinate to be able to um, over that time period. I've got another question from Anson Medical. So there's conflicting information in the EOI regarding supply of PPE and consumables. One section says provided, while another page six says not. This requires clarification. Sure. Happy to take that on notice and go back to the department um, and get it straight from them. So just to, so there's um, no confusion there. Happy to come back to you with that tomorrow. Another question from John. What are the PPE requirements for giving the injection? At this stage, it's uncertain. Um, I've heard full PPE from one organisation, but I'm not hearing that from the department. So until TGA has actually approved the vaccine, um, it will become clear then, but I'm happy to take that one back to the department as well. Another question from Nermit. The EOI, is it individualised to the doctor or to the practice? EOI is to the practice and, and location. So like I say, each location needs to have its own EOI. So it'll be practice-based um, location. The MBS item is a GP attendance item as well. So it will be based on um, per GP and the practice incentive payment, just to confuse it even more, is a practice-based incentive. Another question from Ivy. Will there be either a consenting process or screening process incorporated into the national booking system? Can't answer that one, Ivy, until I get the FAQs. The department said today that all information regarding the national booking system will come out in that document in the next couple of days. So hopefully all the answers will be in that. But they did say that um, there may be some national booking system answers that will come out in a supplement later, perhaps on the weekend. Mm. So they're going to get all the answers that they have confirmed, they're going to get up straight away. We've got another question from Anson Medical. Should we assume and exclude all our nursing home residents and other 1A recipients when looking at cohorts? Um, I, I don't want to say yes or no. Um, my understanding is that the 1A cohort of patients will be done under a different, like it is a different phase, but um, because the hospital hub is based in Dubbo, the reality is that the AstraZeneca vaccine will probably be the vaccine that's given to the majority of our aged care facilities and not the Pfizer vaccine, simply because of logistics of movement of the vaccine from the hub. Um, part of 1A may include GPs that visit aged care facilities and will include GP respiratory clinic staff um, they will be vaccinated in 1A. The logistics of who is doing the aged care 
facilities at this point isn't clear. The department are looking at a surge workforce for each area to assist in the aged care space and disability space, but we're not clear at this point around what that looks like for our area. So I'm happy to take that one and keep it until I find out further information. We've got another question from Tracy. Will all practices eventually receive approval to vaccinate? Yes, they will. That qualifies. Yeah, that qualifies, sorry, that are accredited and meet the criteria. A question from Caroline. If you need to put aside a dose for the second vaccine in the fridge, it'll only have a life of five days. I don't believe the second dose is the first dose. Uh, I think the time life of the vaccine is longer than five days. But in the fridge for two to eight degrees, it only lasts for five days. Sorry, I can't, I, I missed that. Would you mind repeating? Um, once the vaccine's um, filled and you put it into your vaccine fridge, that would be, you have to be used within five days. Um, what What is clear is that you can't take a vial out of the fridge and put it back. Once you remove a vial out of the fridge, it has to be used. So you will have to be doing 10 vaccinations at any one time. So you can't put part of a vial back in the fridge. Once you remove it from the fridge, you have to use it. Yes, but I mean, most practices would not have the cryogenic fridges for a, a storage of the frozen vaccine. So you would be storing in your regular two to eight degree fridge. But the um, part of vaccine has only got a five day life in that fridge. Sorry, we, we are having problems hearing what you're saying. Uh, you may be able to be heard more clearly if you dial in with your telephone rather than using your computer uh, audio. I don't know if that's your situation at the moment. Okay, I'll, I'll just type it in. Thank you. Got another question um, from Sally. Um, her practice in Dunedoo is waiting for first accreditation during the next few months. Um, will the practice be ineligible for rollout of the first phase? Um, Sally, that question came up today with the department and they're coming back to us um, clarifying that situation because there are a lot of practices currently um, undergoing accreditation. So we're just getting confirmation of that. Another question from Ivy. What sort of time frame is expected between phase 1B and phase 2? I suppose the October end date is probably the only indication we've got, isn't it? The department hasn't really said um, a time frame in rollout. It will all depend on availability of the vaccine. So once we're manufacturing it in Australia and have copious amounts available, well then they'll start rolling it out to the next phase. Um, but we haven't been given time frames. And so we're trying to get from the department the amount of vaccines that you'll be given so that you can start doing some modelling around, you have X amount of patients and you only have this amount of vaccine, who's going to go first? That sort of questions have been raised with the department numerous times, but they can't come back to us with any sort of modelling at this point. Um, I guess they're not sure on how many vaccines they have available yet. A question from Chani. Dose one and dose two is different or the same dose? hasn't been confirmed yet. That will depend on TGA um, approval. A 
Another question from Veronica. Will we be assured of receiving enough supplies for second doses to be provided, assuming the interval between vaccinations is greater than five days? Veronica, that's why they're recommending you quarantine the vaccines for the amount of people that you vaccinate in round one, that you've quarantined enough to, for, for round two. Um, there's no, um, the information I've received says that the vaccine can be stored in a fridge for six months. So it, there's no five day rule, but that needs to be confirmed from TGA approval. Question from Natalie, if practices choose not to put an EOI in now due to not having capacity, if their circumstances change, can they um, put an EOI in at a later point and be part of future There's phase? There's an indication that there will be a later round, but they haven't confirmed that. Question from Vivian, if you have a transient patient and they go elsewhere and then travel home asking for their second dose? That, um, that's a possibility, Viv. Um, it just will mean that you won't have access to the PIP incentive payment if the patient hasn't received first and second dose in your practice. Another question from Sally. Are we restricted to the COVID MBS item number when giving the vaccine? Or if we take a regular standard appointment time, could we bill a regular two, three, two, regular 23? If you're giving the vaccination, you have to use the MBS item. But part of the FAQs that will come out in the next few days will clarify the co-claiming rules as well. Question from Ivy. Um, sufficient workforce is an issue. Will it be possible for provider numbers to be organised for GP registrars who are currently on maternity leave or who are working at the hospital to be able to work on the occasional shift? I haven't um, had any guarantees from the department on that one, Ivy, but happy to raise it with them. A question from Eunice. Uh, I'm guessing Eunice is referring to the practices. If there's more than one location, do all the locations need to be accredited? Yes, they do. So each site will need to be accredited and each site will need to have its own EOI submitted. Another question from Tani, non-Medicare card holders, where can they be vaccinated? The GP run clinic, if so, will that be paid separately? At the moment, the discussion has been that they may be done through GP respiratory clinics, not GP practices, but that clarification will come out with further information as well. It has been discussed, so it is on their radar. Question from Veronica. Do nurses need to have completed the nurse immuniser training in addition to the COVID specific training? No, Veronica, they don't. Um, a, a registered nurse can give a vaccination under a GP um, order. The practice themselves will get the training once they've been given approval through the EOI process. So they'll receive the COVID training, but they don't have to be endorsed. But it is um, a GP attendance item number, which means that the GP does need to be in attendance. Question from Anson Medical. For the AstraZeneca vaccine, how long between dose one and dose two, excluding um, the flu vax delay? Do we know this yet? <laughs> I'm hearing 28 days, but um, until we have TGA approval, that information will come from there around the efficacy and how how close they need to be. Um, but I'm hearing 28 days at this point.
A question from Joanne at Anson Medical. Is there any concern regarding supply of syringes and needles um, as it relates to the timeframes um, expected to deliver the vaccinations? Yeah. I will, um, as I said earlier, I'll go back and get clarification around whether they are being provided by the Commonwealth or not, um, because there is some confusion, um, some conflicting statements around that. So I'll get confirmation from the department around whether they are providing them or not, um, but I, you know, or whether practices need to source them themselves. I, I will come back to you with that. Caroline, just regarding the vaccines again, do they have a lifespan of six months in the vaccine fridge? That's what I'm being told, Caroline, but um, like I say, that information will come from TGA once approved, um, all the intricacies around that, but that's what I'm being told at the moment. I've got a question from Debbie. The AMA and FRA CGP chairs have already said that standard consultation items can be charged at the same time, providing there's a legitimate consultation. A question was raised today with the department um, in regards to that, Deb, and they have said that it will be very clear in the FAQ document around the co-claiming. So we're just holding our breath waiting for that document. That's it for the questions so far. If anyone else has anything they want to ask, just use the chat box there to, to put your question in. And I appreciate all the questions. Um, those that I don't have clear answers for, I will get that information out to you as soon as we receive it. Um, like I say, our meetings with the department have been endless chat questions, more questions than answers, so they're taking them on notice as well and going back to the relevant sections of the department to find the answers. So um, hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have that FAQ document that will answer all of this, but I'm happy to take what I can back to the department tomorrow and source the answers. So just to be clear that the department will make the final decision about who gets uh, first uh, dibs. Yeah. Uh, they have been very clear that their priority will be based on numbers. The more vaccinations that can be done, the more likely a practice would be prioritised. So just keep that in mind. We do have another question from Ivy. Will there be contracts issued after an EOI is submitted? And is there still an opportunity to pull out should circumstances change after you submit an EOI? There definitely is um, an opportunity to pull out of your EOI after you've submitted it. The department's been very clear on that, but um, they are yet to come back around contracts or what that document may look like. A question from Kelly. Any idea of how long pre-screening consent might take in terms of the time before the vaccination? No, nothing clear has come to light as yet, but I um, am thinking it would be the similar um, pre-screening consent that you would do for any sort of vaccination. So your flu screening, that sort of thing. It would be similar questions that you need to be asking your patients just in checking that they haven't got temperatures and that sort of thing, um, you know, and whether they might be susceptible to... Um, a reaction and that information will probably come from TGA as well. Just on that earlier question about pulling out, um, the, the broader answer there is if you also want to make an amendment, um, you need to contact the PHN so that we can pass that through you. Sorry, we what we need, you need to put in a second application, completely new second application and then contact us so that the first one can be deleted. So whether you're, and so if you want to make a change, that's the process. If you want to pull out, contact us and we will get it cancelled. Yeah. Thank you.
question from Sally. Is the practice incentive payment one or two $10 payments after completing both vaccinations? It's one $10 payment per completion of the two doses. So it's a $10 incentive um, once the two doses are completed. Question from John. Why is it necessary to have PPE? Can you get the disease from the vaccine? No, you can't get the disease from the vaccine. Um, PPE is, um, we're still waiting on clarification around that. Um, as you can imagine, John, there's a lot of information out there from different organisations. So there is a lot of conflicting information and a lot of confusion. So I'm, I'm waiting on further instructions around PPE and, and like I say, the consumables as well. We've we got... don't normally use PPE when we do vaccinations. So um, I don't know that anything will change. I've got a, a comment from Chani. Um, a recall system will be challenging. So if the PHN can assist practices in designing an effective model, that would be good. Sure, that's not a problem, Chani. Question from Caroline. There's a box to tick in um, Medical Director Program for consent for vaccinations. I imagine other software packages would be similar. Yeah, that's right. It will be informed consent and it'll be how you document it in your clinical software will be um, up to each practice on how they do that. Um, I'm not sure until we get further information around the national booking system whether it will also cover any sort of consent, but um, watch this space until we know what that looks like. Caroline's also added there that most um, of the clinical software for GPs makes it easy to add recalls if necessary. Yes, that's right. Um, they all have the ability to do that and um, the PHN's practice support team can assist any of you with that. So please reach out if you need um, help with anything in regards to COVID and the recall system. That's it for the questions for the moment. We'll just give another couple of minutes to see if there's any last questions. Okay, thank you very much for your time tonight. And I'm sorry that we don't have all the answers, but um, we will take them on notice and come back to you as soon as we can. We do have a question that's come through from Sheila. Uh, will the government cover us if patients die? No, that's why you have to be accredited. Um, I would suggest that you look at your medical indemnity um, as well, but the department's not coming out with any suggestions around that or any advice at the moment. I, I know that you're not the first person to ask that question. Okay, we're all done. No, there's another one coming in. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Please um, reach out if you've got any further questions. You can um, contact me at the PHN if needed or come through Katie or Liz or 
any of your practice support team that you have contact with, happy to take any further questions on notice by email or phone or any avenue and hopefully get some answers for you. Good luck with your EOIs.